Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth and we receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated if you would. We began this morning on the subject of teaching you on the subject of the truth about tithing. God wants us to understand this and it's very important. And we're not just going through this quickly, we're going to look at everything and bring the truth out about this. To summarize what we talked about this morning just briefly, we pointed out that the tithe means the tenth, and we pointed out that the first occurrence in the Word of God of it is in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 to 7, where we see with Cain and Abel, we saw the fact that God gives commands as we looked at the scriptures about him giving commands and how where it says that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord instead of bringing the tithe. It's what he should have brought. But Abel brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof and the Lord added respect unto Abel and to his offering. But then unto Cain and his offering he had not respect which means to be approving of it. Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. We saw that God had commanded them both to bring an expected offering that they were to bring. And that was the tithes of the fruit of their labors. Well, Cain knew exactly what he was to bring, but he didn't bring it. He just brought an offering to the fruit of the ground instead of the tithe. And he and his offering were not accepted. He was not approved whatsoever. As we see down in verse 7, God said to him, If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And remember, doing well means also to be doing what is right. He said, if you don't do well, sin lies at the door. He didn't do well. He sinned. And because of his disobedience to God's command, of course, it resulted in Cain not being accepted, and his offering was not accepted whatsoever. Abel is the one who brought the firstlings. And remember that this firstlings was the tithe, as we saw, of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the firstlings also was the birthright offering, as we pointed out, so that then you would have the right of the firstborn. He wasn't a firstborn, but he was going to bring the birthright offering nonetheless. And of course, Cain was set aside as a firstborn, and Abel was considered a firstborn because of him being obedient to God's command. So he brought the tithe of the flock and the fat that was commanded of him, and he was accepted. He was approved by God. His offering was accepted as well. And we saw also over in Hebrews 11:4, he was declared to be righteous. Well, Abel's offering being the birthright offering, pointing towards the fact that he would have the right of the firstborn, points towards us today because we are the church of firstborns, as we pointed out. And now we as a firstborn are to bring the firstborn offering, the birthright offering, which is the tithe unto him, so then we have the right of the firstborn, which are the blessings of God that would come upon us. We did point out that the offering was not a blood sacrifice, as many people have taught. It is a false teaching. The reason is because this is the word for offering that they both brought. It's the word minkah, and this is a offering which is a gift from an inferior to a superior, and it was never a blood sacrifice. It was always one that was not involving any kind of a blood sacrifice. And so he did not do that whatsoever. Of course, Cain wouldn't have had opportunity to do it because he was a tiller of the ground and there was no problem with him having fruit in the ground, but he didn't have anything to, to be able to sacrifice whatsoever. <coughs> so we pointed this out. It's important to understand. We also talked about how God, the tithing is a command from God. It's required offering expected of him in the birthright offering. So that tells us if we tithe, we will be accepted of him and our offering will be accepted of him. We'll be considered a firstborn and a right to all the blessings and promises of God. But if we don't tithe, then we would not be accepted and our offering would not be accepted and we would not be bringing the, the tithe, which is the, the offering of those who are the firstborn the birthright offering, to have the right for the blessings of God to come upon us. One other thing that we talked about, we just want to mention, and we see this is true today. 
where it says, in the process of time it came to pass. It's not a good translation. When I put the cursor over the word process, I want you to notice down below it's the word kates, and it means end. It doesn't mean process, it means end. It's been translated end 52 times. Process only one times erroneously. That's why Young's corrects it, N. Time is not the word for time, actually. It's the word for day. The word yom is the pr predominant word that they use in the Hebrew for day. Notice, it's been translated day 2,008 times. And furthermore, as we pointed out, that this is a word that is plural. This is the word for day in the Hebrew. You can see it because here's the meaning of it. Notice that it's plural, not singular. That means that it would be translated as Young's has brought it out. It comes to pass at the end of days. Well, what does that tell you? That's a prophetic statement about the end of days now. So it comes to pass at the end of days that Cain just brought an offering to whatever he wanted. What's that telling you? The same thing was going to happen in the church world at the end, and it's happening today, where people just bring whatever kind of offering they want. They don't think they need to tithe now in the New Testament, and that is great error. And so it, it's prophetic of the fact that this same thing was going to happen, and remember, woe unto those that have gone in the way of Cain, as we talked about, and what's happened for them, those were the ones that were reserved, the blackness of darkness forever. We saw those scriptures in Jude, verse 11 and verse 13. God wants us to understand that tithing is important, and it began with Cain and Abel. Well, we're going to pick up after this and move on. In Genesis chapter 14, we're going to speak about Abram, who later is called Abraham. Of course, his name was changed. In Genesis chapter 14, we read, beginning here in verse 18, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. He blessed them and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And it says he gave him tithes of all. Now, what had happened was, Abraham had returned, Abraham returned from rescuing Lot and the slaughter of all the kings who had taken him captive. And in doing so, then when he came back, Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest, he is the one who was blessing Abram. Now, when we see this, it says in verse 20, he gave him tithes of all. Many people have thought that meant for all of the spoils of the war, all the goods that they captured, but that's not what it's talking about. The reason you know is because, look here in verse, verse 21, says the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons and take thy goods to thyself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldst say that I have made Abraham rich. He wouldn't take a thing. Save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men that went with me. In other words, the only people that he was going to take anything for were these men, Anir, Eshkol, Mamre. They were to get their portion and the things that they had taken. Did Abram take, did Abram take anything for himself? No. He took nothing for himself. Yet, he was going to give tithes of what? Of all that the men took, not all of, all of the spoils of the war. When it talks about the all, it's talking about all that was taken for the young men and the portion that the men used up when they went with him. So, why did Abram want to give tithes of them? It wasn't even his. Otherwise, he's going he's to make sure that tithes are paid for somebody else. Why would that be? That's because he understood Tithing was a command, and he understood that it needed to be done before God. Otherwise, you would be in, you would be in trouble, you, know, you would be disobedient to God, and curses would come upon a person. He understood that the tithes were to be brought forth, and so regardless, it wasn't his, but he was going to do it for all of those ones who were the men, what they'd taken. 
There are those who have thought that Abram gave tithes of all that he gained from the spoils of war. We see that's error. It's not. It was only of what the men took. He took nothing of himself. And these ones also bring up the fact that it was customary among pagans to give tithes from the spoils of war. Well, that was so, but that has nothing to do with what was going on in this case. And, of course, they bring that up because they're, re they're rejecting the command to tithe on an ongoing basis. Well, that statement is false because we see the fact that Abram, he didn't give tithes of himself. He was given tithes for the other. Why was that? because of the fact that he understood that it was important that before God. It was a command before God. He knew about the command to tithe, and he made sure that the tithes were given on anything that the men had taken. He was not honoring some pagan custom of the day, as some people try to say. Instead, he was being obedient to God's command. You know, history reveals, if you study it out, that the tithe was common in all these different cultures. It was common and carried out in Babylon and Persia and Egypt and China and all these different civilizations. Tithing has been known universally since ancient times. We can even see this being referred to when Saul, remember when he was the, the uh, or, in, or Samuel, that is in 1 Samuel chapter 8, when the people did not want to have him ruling over them any longer and they said, we don't want you anymore, we want a king over us so we can be like all the rest of the nations. Well, then, of course, God said, okay, yeah, of course, but you're going to tell them, you're going to protest against what they're doing and then tell them what's going to be the result of this. And in the midst of this, look what he said in 1 Samuel 8, 15. He's talking about what the king will do to the people. He's going to take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. Take your men's servants, maid servants, goodliest young men, your asses, put them to his work. He'll take the tenth of your sheep, and you shall be his servants. What was this thing about the tenth? Because everybody knew about the tithe, and these guys would just take a tenth of people's things. It was always here. It was always around. Well, how did they know about this? Where did they get the idea about it? Uh, every, nothing comes except for from God. God's the one who originated it. This, this all came from God. The original command to tithe came from God. It's all originated with him. Another thing we need to look at about Abram is Abram was not obeying some pagan thing that people were going to do. Abram obeyed God's commands. And we really need to look at what kind of a man Abram was. We come over here to Genesis chapter 12. And this is important to put to put to rest these ones that think that he would just follow on some pagan ritual. Now, he wasn't someone who followed those kind of things. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, this is where the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I'll show thee. And he talked about he'd make a great nation, bless him and uh, his name, make his name great, and he'd be a blessing, and he'd bless them with the, that would bless thee and curse them that curse thee, and all the families of the earth would be blessed. And so what did Abram do? He obeyed. He departed. He obeyed God's command to get out of the country and from his father and his kindred and go to a place that God would direct him to. We see in verse 8, He removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, high on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. He didn't listen to pagan things or have anything to do with any paganism. He was a worshiper of God. We see in chapter 14, verse 19, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God. Well, he was called Abram of the Most High God. I meant he was a, a godly person. And he, had, he had this notoriety about him. In Genesis chapter 17, and verse 5, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but name will be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Yeah, because he found that he was one who would listen to him and obey him and follow him. Made a covenant, of course, with him. Then we come down to verse 19 of chapter 18. Look at the testimony that God speaks about Abraham. For I know him. He will command his children, his household after him. They shall keep the way of the Lord 
to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Abraham was obedient to do the things that God told him to do. And then, here we are in Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham did tempt, Abra or God did tempt Abraham and said, Abraham, he said, Behold, here I am. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee in the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. <laughs> oh, that's quite a temptation. You're going to offer your only son as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee. Of course, he obeyed. He was one who followed God and obeyed God exactly what he wanted him to do. Of course, he was doing this knowing that his, he would be raised up from the dead because he said, we're going to go and worship and we'll come again. Well, here in verse 10, when Abraham stretched forth his hand, he took the knife to slay his son. He's ready to go through with it, knowing God would raise him from the dead. The angel of the Lord said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here am I. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not held with thy, thy son, thine only son, from me. He had proved himself, certainly. And here's the testimony about him in Genesis 26, verse 5. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, these the ordinances, and my laws. He kept all these things. He was someone who certainly was not following after any kind of paganism, as people have said. People have made, brought up these objections, you know, to tithing and think that he was just doing it just to follow the paganistic ways. No. <clears throat> he never followed that, that whatsoever. Once he came, the Lord came into his life. Galatians 3, 9, look what it says. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Abraham was called the faithful one. And over in James, Here's the testimony about him here in chapter 22, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works, declared righteous, when he'd offered Isaac his son upon the altar? That's right. And then in verse 3, the scriptures fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God. and It was imputed to him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. That's not someone who follows after paganism. All of these things clearly show he was a man who followed God's commands and obeyed his voice. So he wasn't following these pagan customs. It's all a big lie. When we come down over here, back to Genesis, it talks about Melchizedek, chapter 14 and verse 18. And this is pointing towards that which is the, a type of Jesus in the New Testament. Melchizedek, and this actually means king, he, he's a king of righteousness. The word my, means my king is Sadik, but Sadik is that which means righteousness. It's the word for righteousness. He a, means king of righteousness, king of Salem, which means peace. And he brought forth bread and wine. Well, what's that pointing towards? The body and the blood of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. He was priest of the Most High God. Who's the priest today? Jesus. What order is he after? The order of Melchizedek, who is a king and a priest. This is pointing towards Jesus Christ in the New Testament as the high priest over the covenant, who's king and the high priest. And so he blessed him. And he said, Blessed be Abraham, the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And that's when he gave him the tithes, of course. Showing the fact that this is all pointing towards the New Testament era. See, some people try to say that, well, tithing is not for the New Testament. Well, it sure is. Mil here it's talking about Melchizedek. This is prior to the Old Testament law, and he is a type of Jesus, the high priest today. And he brought the bread and wine, which certainly points towards the work of Jesus Christ in accomplishing redemption in the New Testament. Now, there's more evidence about Abram Abraham being a tither. What we've seen so far is he was tithing for the men, for their portion. Well, people say, okay, but he's been a tither himself. Oh yeah, he was. You're going to see this. Over in Hebrews chapter 7, it speaks of Melchizedek here. 
king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, and met Abram, returned from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And we saw that. In verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave, the word gave is a poor translation. The reason is because it's the Greek word meridzo, which means to divide. It doesn't mean gave, it means to divide. Abraham, as these youngs, brings it out. He divided a tenth part of all. It was all the spoils. Remember, he didn't take it all. He divided a tenth part of all, that which, which is what were the, the part that was the men had used, used, and that was what he tithed on. Verse being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that, the king of Salem, which is the king of peace. Well, we come now to verse 4, and we see about what it talks about him. Now consider how great this man was, and to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave, this does mean give, the tenth of the spoils. And it's interesting what it says here. The word spoils, this word is only used one time in the New Testament, and it means the top of the heap. What does that tell us? When we bring the tithe, it's not the last tenth, it's not the middle tenth, it's the top of the heap. It's the first tenth, isn't it? That's what we're supposed to bring. This shows you that many people just kind of, you know, tithe whenever they get around to it type of thing. Well, that's not what God wants. He wants us to bring the first tenth, the top of the heap, is to be brought unto him. Then we see over in verse 5, it shifts in time ahead to the time in the Old Testament Law, uh, law when the, the, first, the, the covenant was involved in the old covenant with the sons of Levi. For verily they are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood. They have a commandment to take tithes. Notice it's a command just like we've talked about. God doesn't change. It wasn't a command for a while and then now it can be voluntary or just whatever you feel like you want to do. No. It's been a command all along to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. When it talks here about taking tithes, this wasn't just once in a while. This is an ongoing thing that they were to do because it's a present tense, continuous, repeated, ongoing action. They continually took tithes. We're supposed to bring tithes to him on an ongoing basis as well, and it's a commandment of God. Now we come to verse 6. As we said, that Abraham was a tither. And we're going to show you this in this verse. We've got a lot to talk about in this particular verse. It says, He whose descent is not counted from them, talking about Melchizedek, he wasn't a part of the, he wasn't a Levite, he wasn't during the Old Testament time, he was prior to that, received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. This is important to take a look at, and we're going to have to take a look at this from the Greek for a little bit to understand what's being said. First of all, when we look at this word receive tithes, the Greek has tense, voice, and mood. And this is the perfect tense. The perfect tense is a past tense, referring to completed action in the past with present results or effects at the time of speaking, viewing not only what happened in the past, but also at the time of speaking. And the same thing is true when it speaks about blessed. This one also is a perfect tense verb as well. So the perfect tense in the Greek, as we mentioned, is talking about action here that's been completed in the past. Uh, with, we have this, and it really is looking at both ends of the situation, when it was completed in the past, and then also the effects of it or the results of it. Now, when you see a perfect tense, it can mean the action that was occurring might have been continuous and ongoing. You don't know for sure. You have to look at some other things in order to determine it. Otherwise, it could mean a continual process of this going on, uh, of the action in the past. Now, in order for that to happen, the main verb is what you're looking at would have to be a past tense, which it is. The perfect tense is one of the past tenses in the Greek. But then, the only way you could see this to be an ongoing action 
is if you had what's called a present participle. And we're going to share some things about Greek you may not know too much, but it will maybe help you to understand some things and why it's important. The present participle is very important, and that's exactly what this word is, where it says, him that had the promises. It is a present tense participle. The present tense means ongoing action. And why this is important is because when there is a past tense verb, such as a perfect tense, and then a present tense participle, what that means is the action, or the way you would translate this, it would be ongoing action, but in the past. The reason being is what controls, in Greek, the time of the verb is the main verb, which is the received ties, or the blessing, those are the main verb. A participle is like a verbal adjective that's adding something to it, and so this is a present participle adding something to it, but what it's doing, it's telling you the ongoing action in the past. Otherwise, this is past, but now we have some ongoing action in the past. So when you have a past tense main verb with a present tense participle, that is translated not as the present is not translated as a present, it's translated as an ongoing past tense, which in Greek is called an imperfect verb. Now, this is the reason, you may not know Greek, but this is for anybody who knows this, you'll understand what's being said. There are no imperfect tense participles in Greek. They don't exist. Why? because the imperfect tense, which is an ongoing action in the past, is shown by using a past tense main verb, like a perfect, with a present tense participle because it's translated in a past tense way. For instance, it would be translated, uh, like in this case, have, he was having the promises. Otherwise, it's talking about an ongoing action. And this is important because this is telling you that this is an ongoing action that was happening. Otherwise, we're not talking about the one-time thing that happened before when he the spoils of the war, which is what some people say. No. This is him, Melchizedek, receiving tithes and blessing Abraham in an ongoing time because of him having the promises. Now, this brings us to another point. This word had here is a mistake in the translation. The reason being is had is a past tense. If it was had, it would have to be a past tense in the, part, in the participle, but it's not. It is a present tense. So how would you translate that? You have to translate it in a present tense aspect as far as what, what it would be, which is having the promises, showing that you ongoing action that's why Young's translates it having. All the translations translates it had promises. That doesn't tell you anything about any ongoing effect. Instead, it really means having the promises. Now, having said all that, that is important because this is talking about Melchizedek receiving tithes of Abraham and blessing him when he's having the promises. Well, that's important to look at. When was Abraham having the promises? Was he having the promises back in Genesis chapter 14, as everybody tries to say that this is referring to? No, because when do you have the promises? When you come into covenant relationship with God. Had he come into covenant relationship with God yet then? No, Genesis 14, he hadn't come into covenant yet. When did he come into covenant? It's in Genesis chapter 15. In fact, he didn't have confidence in, the, in what he, the, any promises at this point in time because here's where he said, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless, uh, childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And he said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Well, this is where the word came to him and said, This shall not be thine heir, but he that come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And so we come down to here, and he says, 
he t speaks how he's the Lord who's going to bring, give him the land to inherit. And now, this is an important point. Abraham says, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Well, that's not someone who has promises. If they had promises, I know I'm going to get it, right? How am I going to know I'm going to inherit it? That meant there weren't any promises yet for him. Why? Because he wasn't in covenant yet. So what did God do in order to show him that he had the promises? He made a covenant with him. Verse 18, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Otherwise, he made a covenant with him, and now he had the promises. So, in light of all that, when we talk about having promises, that's for those who are in covenant relationship. We can even see that even from other scriptures. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 says, At the same time you are without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. When do you have promise? When you are in covenant. If you're not in covenant, you don't have a promise yet. And we also know from over in Hebrews chapter 8, it also tells us the same thing. When we now, he's a mediator of a better covenant established upon better promises. Promises are always tied into covenant relationship. One does not have promises until he's in covenant relationship. So, back there, or here in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 6, when he's talking about him receiving tithes of Abraham and blessing him, having the promises, when was this? Was this back in Genesis 14? No. It was after he had come into covenant relationship with him, which means Abraham was tithing himself on his own increase. Because this is talking about him doing this on an ongoing basis as well. He received tithes in the past, and it was an ongoing, continuous thing, having the promises, and the result was he blessed him. So why am we telling you all this? It shows the fact that it proves that Abraham tithed himself. And it shows you that Abraham was tithing on an ongoing basis himself, and Melchizedek was blessing him. Of course, we also know he's blessing him. Well, that means he must have been the one who was doing the tithing because that was on his increase. Back in Genesis 14, was he tithing for himself? No, he was tithing for the other men. The reason we bring this out is because this proves that Abraham was a tither. He was a continual tither. And many people have tried to say, well, tithing, it was all, wasn't before the Old Testament law. Yeah, it was. And so, well, Abraham was just tithing for those men. No, he was tithing for himself on an ongoing basis once he had covenant promises. That is important to understand. So, we see, as we're looking at understanding that tithing has been all along, Cain and Abel, they had the command to tithe. Abraham, Abram, before he knew about the tithe and said, I got to tithe for these men. He tithed for them. And then, while his increase is coming, he's tithing to Melchizedek continually and being blessed by him for any kind of increase that he would have got himself. So that is important to understand. Next we come to is Genesis chapter 28. And in Genesis chapter 28, now we're talking about Jacob. He was a tither as well. Genesis 28, first of all, we pick up in verse 10. Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. This, took the stones of the place and put them for pillows, lay down in the place to sleep. This is when he had the dream. He dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now, What's, he talk, what's going on here? Notice verse 13. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it into thy seed. 
What kind of a statement is that? That's a covenant statement because he made a covenant with Abraham and confirmed it then on with Isaac. And he's talking about the land that he's giving. This is a co covenant. What is he doing? He is declaring the covenant that he made with Abraham and with Isaac. And he's saying that it's going to be for him as well. To thee I will give it. So he's basically speaking about covenant relationship with him. Now we come down to verse 20. And Jacob vows a vow saying, If God will be with me, because of covenant relationship, and will keep me in this way that I go, he'll protect me, and give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, he'll meet my needs. He'll be the Jehovah Jireh, the one who will meet all of my needs in my life, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Otherwise, he's going to have, again, protection. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, when he says, all that thou shalt give me, that means he's looking to God as a source now. And he's expecting God to give him a prosperous way because of the covenant relationship. I will surely give the tenth unto thee. What this means is the fact that, again, God had spoke to him about covenant relationship. And so he's essentially vowing a vow in response to the covenant relationship that God told him what he would give him. That, yeah, oh, oh. If he, God would provide all these things for him, he says, I'll give the tenth to thee. Otherwise, he's going to be a tither because of the covenant blessings and, and promises that are coming to pass in his life. There's another thing that's important here also, because many people say, well, I don't see tithing in the New Testament. Well, we do see it, but also there's so many things in the Old Testament that point towards the New Testament. We already saw it with the birthright and the right of the firstborn. Well, we also saw it with Melchizedek, with the, with the, you know, the bread and, and, and the wine, which would be the, like the grape juice type of thing, pointing towards uh, the work of Jesus Christ accomplishing redemption. Well, here's another one right here. It so says, this stone which I've set for a pillar shall be God's house. Well, what does it say over the New Testament about this? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. If I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. So what's the house of God? It's the church. And what is he talking about back there? He's talking about the house of God. This stone is to be set up as a pillar in the house of God. Well, what about the stone? Well, what would be the stone that's the that's the, the, the basis for the house of God. It'd be the cornerstone, wouldn't it? Who's the cornerstone? It's Jesus. What do we see over here in Acts chapter 4 and verse 10? He said, Be it known unto you all, to all the people of Israel, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, does this man stand here before you whole? This is the stone. Aha which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. That's Jesus, the cornerstone. And of course, he's the one who is the one who produces the salvation. So they rejected, as he says, you set it not, the, the, this, this stone, which was Jesus, the cornerstone of the house of God. And what happens when you and I get born again? Remember we talked about here about this house of God? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, You also as lively stones, or living stones, were pictured as stones in the, spirit, in the spiritual house of God. Are built up a spiritual house, holy priesthood, offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it's contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Who's that? The cornerstone is Jesus. The living stones are you and me. And so we go back to Genesis. And what is he prophetically really speaking of? He's speaking of the true house of God. The stone, which I've set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And what's God's house today? It's the church. Jesus is the cornerstone. And of all that thou shalt give me, I'll surely give the tenth unto thee. Where? In the house of God. 
Well, this is all pointing towards this stone, which is Jesus. And so we're the living stones, and this church is the house of God. And what's he saying? I'm going to give a tithe. That shows and points towards the New Testament age, where you and I, the living stones in this house of God, are to bring tithes unto the Lord. Exodus, chapter 13, verse 11. It shall be when the Lord shall bring thee in the land of the Canaanites, he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee. Thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that open the matrix and every firstling, that was the tithe, that cometh of a beast that, that which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord's. The tithe was something that was set apart. It needs to be set apart in our life. And notice, it was belonging to the Lord's. You see, you've got to understand, the tithe is the Lord's. It belongs to Him. This is why, why would it be that they rob God in Malachi 3 when we get to that? Because they took what was God's. In other words, one-tenth of your income is not yours. Only nine-tenths is yours. One-tenth is God's. And if you take that and don't give it to him, pay it actually to him, you've robbed God. Why would I rob God? I took what was his. Well, that means it has to be his. It's not mine. And that is the important revelation that people need. The first tenth of your income isn't yours. And if you don't pay it to God, you have robbed him of what belongs to him. It is to be set apart. Why? Because it's the Lord's. Exodus 23, verse 19. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Where do we bring it to? You bring it to the house of the Lord. You bring it to the church where for the gospel to go forth in the New Testament. So again, this is talking about as well. So many places, and we're just going to go through these just to let you see these scriptures. Exodus 34, 19, every firstling among the cattle, again, that, that's mine. It all belongs unto the Lord, as he says. And then he comes down to verse 26. First of the first fruits of the land, you bring in the house of the Lord. You won't see the kid in his mother's milk. Same thing, first of the first fruits, it belongs to him. We come over to Leviticus chapter 2, verse 12. For the oblation, or the offering, this means, of the first fruits. You shall offer them unto the Lord. They shall not be burned on the altar for a sweet savor. So you didn't burn. It wasn't one of the burnt offerings. You're going to offer it and bring it to the Lord. Remember, it's given as like an inferior to a superior, giving it unto him. We also see in Leviticus 27. We saw this this morning, but we'll look at it again because it's so important to realize. The firstlings of the beasts. That would be the tithe of the beasts, which should be the Lord's firstling. No man shall sanctify it, whether it be ox or sheep. It's the Lord's. The tithe is the Lord's. What else? Verse 30. The tithe of all the, of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It's holy unto the Lord. It belongs to Him. We can't touch the holy things and take the things that are holy before the, that belong to Him. Verse 32, concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, we saw this this morning. How did they compute the tithe of the animals? The tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Otherwise, they just separate the tenth one out and give it unto him. Numbers. So we're looking through just these scriptures that show throughout the word of God about the tithe. Numbers 18, 17. The firstling of a cow, or the firstling of a sheep, or the firstling of a goat, they shall not redeem. They're holy. Uh, you can't do something with them. They're holy. They belong to God. You've got to give them to God. Thou shalt sprinkle the blood upon the altar, and burn their fat for an offering made by fire for a sweet savor unto the Lord. All the heave offerings of the holy things. Heave offerings were free will offerings, and that included the tithes of the holy things that they had to bring unto the Lord. It was important that they would bring these, these heave offerings to him. And when we come down here, he talks about, Behold, I've given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for inheritance. 
who were Levites. They were the priests that were carrying out the service in the, chur in the, in the church, and it would be in the house of the Lord. And so what was that for? For their service, which they served. So what is the tithe for? It's for the service of the ministry in the church, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. That's the purpose for it. And in verse 24, it speaks of this, the tithes of the children of Israel, they offer as a heave offering. It was to be willingly given unto God, although at the same time, it's actually, you're not giving, you're actually paying tithes because it belongs to Him. It is His. So that's an important thing to realize. It's not you just deciding to give. Instead, you're just being obedient to pay the tithes that belong unto the Lord. We see over in verse 26, Thus you say, speak to the Levites, say to them, when you take of the children of Israel the tithes, which I've given you them for your inheritance, then you will offer up a heave offering and for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. Well, this tells you that the ones who were in the service of the Lord, they had to tithe themselves. This is why anybody that's in the church, a minister or anybody that would receive income from the service of the Lord, they got to tithe on their own. Otherwise, the ministry has to tithe too. It's not just receive from something and not tithe. Everybody has to tithe. And that's what this is talking about. Then we come down to verse 28. The heave offering was offered to the Lord of your tithes, which you receive of the children of Israel, and you shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. Well, what was Aaron? He was the high priest. So what does that mean? When you're bringing those tithes, we're giving them to the high priest. Who's the high priest today? Jesus is taking that and then setting it for the, for the Father and worshiping Him. You also, you can't be taking the things that are holy before the Lord. He said, you shall bear no sin by reason when you've heaved from it the best of it. Neither shall you pollute the holy things of the children of Israel. Uh, you can't do that by taking it for yourself, which is the way they pollute it, lest you die. There was a curse of death and destruction that was upon them. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 12, we pick up in verse 6 as we're going through, looking at all these scriptures. Thither shall you bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifice, your high, uh, tithes, heave offerings of your hand, your vows, your free will offerings, and the firstlings of your herds and your flocks. Everything was to be brought. Whatever kind of increase that you had was the tithe that you were to bring unto the Lord. There you shall eat before the Lord your God. What's the purpose? It's for you then to be able to eat. And what are we eating? We're eating the spiritual food of the Word of God that is given forth from the ministry that's sowing the Word out. Otherwise, that comes in to support the ministry, and then the ministry is going to give out the Word of God to you. They certainly aren't going to sit there and do what the churches do today and give a scripture and then ramble or tell jokes and these kind of things. <laughs> no, you're supposed to be eating the Word of God and be sown the truth. So you're going to eat before the Lord of, there before the Lord and now how, what are we eating? The Word, the food. We eat the spiritual food of the Word of God that is coming to us. What else do we see? In Deuteronomy 24, or 14 that is, verse 22, you tithe all the increase of thy seed, all your increase, whatever increase it might be. Verse 23, when you eat before the Lord your God and the place where he shall choose to place his name there, which is the church, the tithe of thy corn, wine, and thine oil, the firstlings of thy herds and flocks, what's, going to be, what's it going to do? That you may learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Because if you don't do it, you're going to have curses coming upon you for robbing God. <laughs> You'll learn to fear the Lord because you know, i got to bring this unto Him because it belongs unto the Lord. So important. Chapter 15, verse 19. Firstling males that come out of the herd of the flock that you shall sanctify in the Lord your God. You do no work with the firstling of the bullock nor shear the firstling of the, of the sheep. Otherwise, it belongs to the Lord. You're not supposed to do anything with it whatsoever. Now we come to Deuteronomy 26. We looked at this this morning, but we want to look at it again. 
It shall be when you come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for inheritance, and possess it and dwelleth it. When do we come into the spiritual land for inheritance? When we get born again, right? We come into covenant relationship. We got all these promises that belong to us. And we're now heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And what are we supposed to do? You take of the first of all the fruit of the earth that you bring. Well, that's the tithe of your increase. You go to the place where the Lord, your God, shall choose to place his name there, which would be the church, which is bringing forth the word of God. You go into the priest that shall be in those days. And who's the priest in these days is talking about? Jesus, the high priest. Because you're not only going to bring it unto the person that's there in the church or the church for the ministry, but you're at the same time, you're simultaneously bringing it to the high priest in those days, who's Jesus. That's why when we tithe, we're not just bringing it to the church for the ministry of the church to go forth, but we're also bringing it to Jesus simultaneously. And we see that in Hebrews chapter 7 in verse 8, which we'll see when we get over to that. We come to verse 4. The priest will take the basket out of the hand and set it down before the altar. What do we do at the altar? We worship. You are to worship him with that which is the tithe, which belongs unto him. And then we come to verse 10. I brought the first fruits of the land, O Lord, that you've given me. You set it before the Lord thy God and worship before him. You are to worship with the tithe. That's important. It's worship unto God. And when you worship him, what's going to happen? He is going to then look down and bring his blessings upon you. We see this over in verse 15. Look down from thy holy habitation from heaven. Bless the people Israel and the land which thou hast given us as thou swear unto our fathers a land that floweth with milk and honey. That's what God wants. And he will do that. Here's another place that's important to see. Second Chronicles, and this also shows the picture of tithing in the New Testament. Second Chronicles chapter 31, this is talking about the time of Hezekiah. We pick up over here in verse 4. Moreover, he commanded the people that dwell in Jerusalem to give the portion of priests and Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. What was the portion? It was the tithe to bring unto them. As soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits, that's the tithe, corn, wine, oil, honey, and all the increase of the field and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. Concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep, and the tithe of holy things that were consecrated to the Lord, and laid them by heaps. He were bringing this in from all over the place. Look what it says here in verse 7. This is important. In the third month they began to lay the foundation, the heaps, which is the tithes, and they finished them in the seventh month. Well, what's significant about that? The third month in the Hebrew calendar is Siwan. What happened in the third month? Pentecost. That's the beginning of the church age. What's the seventh month? Tishri. The seventh month. What's that? That's the end of the church age, when Jesus comes back. So what's this talking about doing it from the third month to the seventh month? It's a picture of bringing in the tithes in heaps during the church age for the funding of the ministry. This shows, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that tithing continues through the church age in the New Testament. As many people have tried to say that it doesn't, and it is totally wrong whatsoever. So, tithing began with Cain and Abel, continued with Abraham and, Abraham, Abraham and Jacob, continued through the Old Testament law period, and it continues to the time of the New Testament. Here's another place, as we see, it's all the third to the seventh month speaks of the New Testament era. Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 35. To bring the first fruits of our ground, the first fruits of all the fruit of all trees, year by year, into the house of the Lord. Firstborn of the sons, their cattle, written in the law, firstlings of our herds and flocks, to bring to the house of God, uh, uh, of our God, unto the priests that minister in the house of our God. And that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and our offerings and fruit of all manner of trees, of wine and oil, unto the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God and the tithes of our ground. This is why there was no problem with fruit of the ground. 
Cain just didn't bring the tithes of the ground. He just brought an offering, whatever he wanted to do. You bring it on the Levites, the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of their tillage. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites. When the Levites take tithes, the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes into the house. Otherwise, the Levites, who were the ministry, had to bring the tithe of the tithes. They have to tithe as well unto the house of our God, to the chambers, unto the treasure house. They had to bring all these things in. Now, if they didn't do it, what would they be doing? He says in verse 39, For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn, new wine, oil, unto the chambers, where are the vessels of the sanctuary and the priests that minister, and the porters and the singers, and we will not forsake the house of our God. That means if someone is not tithing, they're actually forsaking the church. They're forsaking the house of God instead of doing the things that God wants us to do. Man, that's a great mistake. In fact, they had a real problem in Nehemiah, and he got after them. We come over to Nehemiah 13, verse 10. He said, I perceived the portions for the Levites had not been given them. Now, they were being forsaken. The Levites, the singers that did the work, were fled everyone to his field. I contended with the rulers, this is the leaders, and said, why is the house of God being forsaken? Because they weren't bringing the tithes. And the rulers, the leaders, were, must have been responsible because they weren't directing the people what they were supposed to do. I gathered together, them together and set them in their place and brought all Judah the tithe of the corn, the new wine and, and oil into the, the treasuries. And, and then they were made the treasures over the treasures and counted faithful and they were beginning to distribute it to the brethren the way they were supposed to. Notice, he said here that he set them in their place. All these ministries, all these pastors, all these churches that do not teach tithing, they need to all be set in their place. They need to be straightened out. That's a basically what he's saying. They've been forsaking the house of God. He came to straighten them out. They all need to come in line with the word of God and start teaching tithing and seeing the tithes coming in to the house of God so the house of God is not forsaken. Proverbs chapter 3. In Proverbs chapter 3, we come over to verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So, what is the tithe going to be? It's going to be all your increase, whatever your increase would be of any type. When it says, Honor the Lord with your substance, that shows you something because this is an imperative commanding statement. It's commanding you and I to honor the Lord with our substance and the first fruits of our increase. Meaning, when you're bringing the tithe to Him, you're honoring the Lord. Because remember, it belongs to Him. That means someone that won't be a tither, they're dishonoring the Lord. The Lord. They're being a disgrace. They're not bringing honor to Him. That's a mistake. And we can't be thinking we're going to see God bless us if we're not honoring Him. We're to honor him with our substance and with the first fruits of all of our increase. Well, what happens when you do that? Remember, God's blessings will come. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty. Yeah, that's tremendous prosperity. And thy presses shall burst out with new wine, meaning that's all the, the produce, production that would come from all their, their crops. Tremendous prosperity and blessing will come. You have abundance. You'll be filled with plenty. And you'll have tremendous prosperity, increased production in whatever it is you put your hands to. That is what God wants for everybody. Proverbs 11, verse 24. There is that scattereth and yet increases. You're sowing, you know, God multiplies things. There is that withholdeth more than is meat. Or this is the word means something that's upright or right. What would be a person withholding more than what's right or upright? They're not bringing the tithe. They're just doing whatever they want to do themselves. What happens to them? It tends to poverty. Poverty is a curse. They'll be cursed. People that will not be a tither, they're going to have a curse of poverty manifesting against them in their life. The liberal soul be made fat, and he that waters shall be watered also himself. Blessings will come. We go over to Ezekiel chapter 20. 
all these different places where it speaks about this. Verse 40. Mine holy mountain, the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God, be, uh, there shall all the house of Israel, all of whom them in the land serve me, there will I accept them, there will I require your offerings and the first fruits of your oblations with all your holy things. He was requiring this of them. He just didn't do whatever they wanted to do. His commands, remember, you follow the way of the Lord and do what he says. And then you see the blessings. Ezekiel 44, verse 30. And the first of all, the first fruits of all things, every obligation of all, that's the tithe, isn't it? Every sort of your oblation shall the priest, shall be the priest. You shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough. And look at the blessing that'll come. That he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. Your household will be blessed when you're a tither. You know, I've seen a lot of Christians' households that aren't blessed. Well, have you been tithing? Uh, no. No wonder. You're not going to see any blessings coming in your household if you will not be a tither. It will not happen. And even here is another place where he talks about it in Ezekiel. Chapter 48, verse 14. They shall not sell of it, neither exchange nor alienate the first fruits of the land. Well, how would I alienate the first fruits of the land? I don't bring them unto him. It's holy unto the Lord. The tithe is holy. It belongs to him. It's his. It is something that we are to pay. Now, the next one we come to is Malachi. We're going to take a little bit of time on this one. You need to see what is being said. In Malachi chapter 3, he talks about, verse 1, sending the messenger, preparing the way of the Lord, was preparing the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Well, that's the church. He's going to suddenly come to the church because judgment's going to come to the church before it comes to the world, remember? He's going to come. Who may abide the day of his coming? When he comes... And we already taught on this in the past. Who shall stand when he appears? He's like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. Oh, the refiner, what's he doing? He's testing us. He's refining us in order to get us right. And like a fuller's soap, the fuller is the one who washed white as snow. That means God's coming to his church to make sure, find out who's going to be white, who's going to be pass the test, who's going to come to the place to be refined and pure and be washed completely, no more spots whatsoever. That's what he's coming to do. He'll sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He'll purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. What are we supposed to be? An offering in righteousness, right? It's only the righteous that are going to be received by him so why are we an offering in righteousness? Because we got the fruits of righteousness. We're doing righteousness. We're walking in the ways of righteousness. So we come down here, and verse 5, he says, I will come near to you to judgment. He's going to come and find out who's going to be right and who's not. I'll be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against the false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling his wages, widow, fatherless, and turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, who's the one that would be oppressing the widow and the fatherless and those ones? It'd be the guy that's not tithing, because what was the tithe? It was brought in so that then the fatherless and the widows would be ministered to. That was the purpose of it. Oh, that meant these guys would not be doing what they're supposed to do. He said, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you've gone away from mine ordinances. Ordinances, those are statutes. Those are things that he set forth as laws, <clears throat> but they're ex expected to obey the ordinances of God. And you haven't kept them. He said, return unto me and I'll return unto you. Otherwise, repent. Sayeth the Lord of hosts, he said, wherein shall we return? They didn't even know, they were so far away, they didn't even understand what the problem was. Will a man rob God that you've robbed me? You say, wherein have we robbed thee? 
in tithes and offerings. Because remember, the first tenths is whose? It's God's. It's not ours. If we take the first tenth, we're a robber. We're a thief from God's standpoint. We're robbing in tithes and offerings. We can't be doing that whatsoever. And notice what happens when you do. You're cursed with a curse because of robbing God. For you've robbed me. Not only robbing God, but if you didn't bring it into the church, you've robbed them, so you're robbing the whole nation. Yeah, they don't have what they need. They don't, need the, they don't have the provision that they need for the ministry. That's what happens. Then he comes to verse 10, and he says, Bring. This is a command. This isn't a suggestion. Try your best. See if you can work it out. No. Imperative mood. It is a command to bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Now oh, that's going to be spiritual food. It was, they also had physical food to feed the ones, but also spiritual food to feed everybody. And he goes on and says, and prove me now herewith. When he says, prove me, this is God speaking to us. Examine, try, prove me. This is the place where God is telling us to prove Him. And the word prove is a command as well. So God is commanding you and me to prove God. Otherwise, He's wanting you to prove Him. You bring those tithes into Him and you prove me. If I'll not what? If I'll not open you the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing, there isn't any room enough to receive. It would just, there'd be, as the Young brings it out, a blessing until there's no space. The blessings just keep coming and you have no more room for them. That's what God wants. Blessings just overtaking you. When it talks about the windows of heaven, we'll come back to this. We pointed this out this morning, but for you who weren't here, this isn't just a crack in the window to let a little bit through. No. Genesis 7:11, when they opened up the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened, that's when the flood came. The floodgates were opened and poured out tremendous, tremendously. That's what you must understand. God will bring tremendous blessings. This is the promise of God that he's brought forth. So we go back to Malachi 3:10. And he says here about he'll pour out a blessing there isn't even room enough to receive. Then we come to verse 11. What else will he do? Not only that, he's going to deal with the enemy trying to steal from you. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And the devil's not going to devour you. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Otherwise, you're going to see everything, your work of your hands, prosper and be blessed. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. The things wouldn't be you know, starting to grow and then fall apart in whatever aspect in your life. Essentially what that would say, it was working, but now it hasn't worked. I don't see the fruit. It didn't, didn't come to fruition. No. That's the work of the devil, see. God will make sure that things prosper because you're doing the right thing. All nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a, blessed, a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. But then he comes, look what he says in verse 13. He's now getting after them. And remember, they weren't doing what he told them to do. Well, what was their problem? Your words have been stout or hardened against me. They were speaking words against God, saying, what, yet you say, what have we spoken so much against thee? You're saying, what did we do wrong? You know, acting like they, they didn't do anything, you know. He said, you said it's vain to serve God. It's worthless, it's empty, it doesn't produce anything to serve God. And what way would they be serving God? In tithes and offerings. What profit is that we've kept his ordinance? What ordinance? The ordinance of tithes and offerings. That's the whole context. That we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. Now we call the proud happy and yea that work wickedness are set up. He's talking about all the people that, aren't, that are outside of the covenant. You know, the devil's working, prospering them, but are they going to get anywhere? No, they're going to end up being burned up and destroyed because they're not right with God. And he goes on, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. <laughs> uh, 
who were the ones that were tempting God, the ones that weren't tithing and that weren't walking in his ways and being disobedient unto him. Now, he says, then they that feared the Lord. Who are the ones that fear the Lord? The ones that are tithing and keeping his ordinance. Spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And then notice what about these ones that fear the Lord. A book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord. Well, who's that? That's the tithers that are fearing God. God remembers all the tithers. Well, that's good news. And that also means if you're not a tither, you're not in that book of remembrance. That's a problem. And that thought upon his name. He said, they shall be mine. Who? The ones that are the tithers that have been serving him, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, the jewels, we're going to be like jewels to him, which is what? His valued property, his peculiar treasure, his possession. The ones that he's going to consider, you're mine. Well, who would he consider who's mine? Certainly the ones that give him what belongs to him. How about if you rob God? <laughs> Are you going to be considered one of his jewels? No. <laughs> and I will spare them his jewels, meaning I will have compassion on them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Otherwise, they're going to have the compassion, Lord. They're going to be protected in what is coming. Because remember, the judgment is coming to the church. That was what it talked about in the beginning, to refine them and find out who's going to be right and who's not going to be right. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous, that's the one that's certainly in the context, tithing and doing what he says, and the wicked. Remember, these are the criminals, the ones who are guilty, the ones that are stealing, the ones that are, are robbing God. They're a criminal in God's sight. Between him that serveth God, that's the one bringing the tithes in, and him that serveth him not, who would that be? The one who's not serving him. They're robbing God and the whole house of the Lord, as it says. For behold, he says, now look, the day cometh that is going to burn as an oven, and all the proud, that must be one of the roots behind people that don't tithe. They want to serve self. I, 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 me, me, me. They don't want to give anything up. It's all mine. That's pride spirit, see? And all those that do wickedly, they're robbing God and they're doing whatever they want. They're going to be stubble. They're going to be judged. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, neither, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. They're going to be burned up and destroyed. But what happens to the ones who fear his name? Those are the ones that are the tithe. They're serving him, right? Unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Yeah, that's the Lord. He's going to manifest his healing power. You shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. You're going to grow up and become strong and mighty. Are you ever going to grow up if you're not a tither and you're just a robber of God? You're going nowhere. <laughs> you shall tread down the wicked because you're going to operate in authority and power. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. You're going to destroy all the works of the enemy. But if you're not a tither, are you going to see this happen? No. Because you're not right, see. Although on the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. And he talked about all these things that he commanded them. Now people say, well, this is just all talking about the Old Testament stuff. No, that's talking about them coming to, there's a combination of the old but also in the new because he's talking about coming to them to refine them and find out if they're going to be right or not. And also, we know this because I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. What day is that? Now that's the day of the Lord at the end when the judgment's coming. What does that tell you? Well, that means it must not be just in the Old Testament period. It's got to be gone through the entire New Testament period under the time of when the day of the Lord is. That's right. So Malachi is talking about not only the Old Testament period, but the New Testament period. And it's talking about those people who are tithers versus those who are not tithers. 
The tithers are the ones who have the fear of God, the ones that are serving him, the ones that are going to obey in his command. They're the ones that are going to prove God and see the blessings coming upon them. They're the ones that are written in the book of remem rem remembrance. They're the ones that are his jewels, you know, special possession that he's going to have protection for. <laughs> that are mine, he says. You're mine. But all the rest of them, they're in trouble. They're the ones that are called wicked. They're the ones that don't serve God. Those are the ones that are going to get burned up. Those are the ones that are not going to be right with the Lord because they haven't obeyed God. They're the ones that are proud. Those are the ones that are wicked. Robbers, stealers. That's the way God views them. That's pretty astounding. But that's the picture that we see here in Malachi. Meaning, we've got to understand, if we don't tithe, we are cursed. <laughs> Big time. He expects every one of us to be a tither and to put the Word of God first place in all things. The tithe is His. That means when you get your paycheck, 10% of that, it's not yours. If you keep it, you rob God. What's going to happen? You're cursed with a curse. I wonder why things aren't panning out. <laughs> I wonder why I thought I was doing a good job and everything seemed to fall apart. Because the curse is coming. The devourer has not been rebuked. The, I'm, I'm doing something going forward and all of a sudden it seems to crash. My vine cast its fruit before its time. It didn't come forth. No blessing. That's not what God wants. God wants us to be blessed. And that's why he commands us, bring them, bring the tithes, prove me. I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. The blessing will rest on our house. Look at all those tremendous blessings that he talks about. We'll have plenty, it said. Your barns will be filled with plenty and your presses will burst out with new wine. God will do great things because he's a performer of his word. And this also shows that you really trust him in covenant relationship. We're in covenant relationship. That's what these guys realized. That's what Jacob said. Hey, I'm going to give you the tithe if I'm in covenant relationship because he knew the blessings were going to come upon him. What happened with Abram, Abraham? He was given all of his tithes to Melchizedek and he's blessing him and it was ongoing action. That's what it's saying in Hebrews 7, 6 because of the present participle. Continua. Praise God what God will do if you and I will do the word. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that brings revelation about the tithe. It is yours. It belongs to you. It is holy. I cannot take the tithe or I've robbed you. I will not rob you. I will bring the tithe to you. I will give it to you freely as a heave offering, giving it to you, willingly. I thank you that as I'm doing it, I am honoring you with my substance and the first fruits of all my increase. I thank you for filling my barns with plenty and my presses bursting out with new wine. I am obedient to your command to bring the tithes and I am obedient to the command you said to prove you. I am proving you because I'm obedient to your word. You open the windows of heaven. You pour out your blessings that are even room enough to receive. And you rebuke the devourer for my sakes. My fruit will not cast its fruit, or my seed will not cast its fruit before the time. Everything I put my hands to will prosper. I'm a blessed, delightsome land. I have the fear of the Lord. I will be written in a book of remembrance. I'll be one of your jewels, one of your special possession. You will protect me in the judgments. And because I have the fear of God, the Son of Righteousness will arise and bring healing. And I will grow up and become strong and mighty. And the enemy be tread underfoot like ashes under my foot. 
because I'm a tither. I put you first place. And you will do tremendous things in all areas of my life. I thank you. I get the picture. I understand that I am going to be a tither. Because of covenant relationship with you, these promises will come to pass. I thank you for performing your word in my life as I am obedient to be a tither and to do what you command. Thank you for performing your word, your blessings resting on my house, all these tremendous blessings you will bring forth because I am a hearer and a doer of your word and I am a tither consistently all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Tremendous blessings that will happen. And of course, we can't be doing the opposite. Our curses come on us left and right. And the end result, if we're not written in the book of remembrance, we're in trouble. And we're going to be in the burn up crowd. Uh, we don't want to be burn up. We want to be the ones that are spared and blessed and seeing God do great things. Father, thank you for all that you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of your word. And we will be tithers all the days of our life and we will see your promises come to pass. Thank you for your word that shows us the truth. We thank you that we prove you, and we know that as we're obedient, then you perform your word. Thank you for the tremendous blessings that you're coming upon every one of us as we are consistent tithers. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.